Are we not the bearers of witness that nothing would exist if Allah didn't create it? And that He is alone and has no partners? And that all gratitude is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the sustainer of all the boundless universes? All gratitude is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the generous eternal friend? And send salutations of Allah on all of His prophets and His apostles and on the Messiah, the anointed one and on the Mahdi, the guide and on the Mujadda, the reform which was all sent from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We send greetings and we send peace throughout the boundless universe to all Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh you are now listening to The True Light with the Sayyid Ali Mamisa Al Hadi Al Mahdi in a live question and answer session. The Jesus Christ spoken of in the Bible, is this the Jesus Christ that we to look for in the end of the world, the one that's coming back? First of all, let's establish the word Christ. We have to start saying Messiah. You have a Bible with you? No, I don't. It's important when you come, you bring your tools. <laughs> if you open the Bible to St. John's chapter 1, verse 41, He first finds his own brother Simon and said unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted Christ. You see that? Yes. Now what did that mean? That means that these people who were Jesus' disciples and Christians use this chapter to death. They use this St. John's chapter 1 to death. That Jesus' own disciples knew that he should have been called the Messiah and not Christos from the Latin. You follow? So now, yes, yes is the answer to your question and no. Revelations 1 tells us that the Jesus that they're expecting to come will be like him, not him. Revelations chapter 1 reads, The revelations of Jesus the Messiah, and as you see they have Christ, which the Creator, which they have as God, gave unto him. Gave unto who? To Jesus. Right? That's right. To show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Now the first point is that with this teaching, Jesus is talking about his servants. Jesus told a woman in Matthew 15, the story when Jesus is dealing with a Canaanite woman, he told her he was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel only. So his servants would have to be the tribe of Judah, the lost sheep. Because he was talking to all the rest of them. You see? Now, to show unto his servants which must shortly come to pass. Which means there's going to be a future tense here. Things that did not happen during his life, but things that was going to happen in the future. Now here's the catch. 
And he did what? He sent it and signified it by his who? His angel unto his servant John. Right? All right, brother. <laughs> so what happened here, and Christians tend to overlook, is that the revelation of Jesus, the Messiah, which the Lord gave unto him for his servant, Jesus sent it, signifying it with an angel unto John. This angel that Jesus sent it, signifying it by, was none other than the angel Michael, who has the power throughout the book of Revelations, like if you go to Revelation chapter 12, he had the power to defeat Satan. Chapter 12, 7 of Revelations, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. You see that? Yes, I see it. And the dragon fought and his angels. So here we have Michael and some angels of his who are fighting against this dragon and his angels. Who is the dragon and who are his angels? Well, eight says, and prevail not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. So that means that these dragon and his angels was cast out of heaven at this point. And the great dragon was cast out. That old what? Serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. You see that? Yes, I see it. So Michael was an angel who was back there in the beginning. However, when these people deal with St. John's chapter 1, now we go back to St. John's chapter 1 and start from the beginning, we're going to see this beginning story. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with the Creator, and the Word was the Creator. The same was in the beginning with the Creator. <laughs> you see? The angel Michael was back there in the beginning, and where the angels of Michael was the angel Gabriel, who was also back there in the beginning, who fought against Lucifer and his fallen angels. And the angel Gabriel was the angel sent to Mary to tell her that she was going to conceive of the Holy Ghost, which would be Jesus the Messiah. What people are looking for in the return of Jesus is the return of is Jesus sending forth an angel in his likeness. And people will mistake the angel for Jesus. You follow that? Yes, I do, brother. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Uh, I'm somewhat confused, but this is Exodus I'm looking at, and there's a conversation between the Lord and Moses. Where are we at in Exodus? I'm in um, Exodus, I mean, yes, Exodus 3, the 13th verse. There's a long conversation between Moses and the Lord. It's God, the Lord. The 13th says, Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. I better let that go at that. Like I said, I'm a little confused. Well, well tell me what confuses you. Pardon me? What part of it is confusing you? Well, I'm not a scholar in, uh, in the scripture. Yeah, I understand. Or in religion. Yes. So I just thought that I would uh, ask the question, since you spoke of Minister Farrakhan and and he said that God, the original man, is the black man. So that would mean that the black man is God. And 
when I look in, um, in the Bible, I have searched God just about all my life, whether he was uh, black, Caucasian, or whatever. So the question is, in Exodus chapter 3, verse 13, And Moses said unto God, Behold, right, when yes. I come unto the children of Israel, yes. and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? Go ahead. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. Yes, correct. All right, what is the question? And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me. All right. So now, the God who said back then to Moses was a man. Am I right? No. The Lord no. who was speaking this was not a man. No. Okay, so maybe you know how you find out? Okay, maybe you could explain. That. Yeah, <laughs> go back to the go back to the beginning of Exodus three. Okay. You see, beginning of Exodus three. Where are you? Exodus, Exodus, Exodus three. three. Okay. Now, now Moses. You. <laughs> now Moses. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro. Yes. His father-in-law. This was in the land of Midian, right? Yes. And the priest of Midian, and he led his flock where. To the back side of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even in Horeb. Right. Is that Horeb? Is that a... Uh, that's a place. That's a place? That's, where, a, that's a specific spot on a mountain where Moses received revelation. Where is that? It's in Sinai. Now, but let's go on so we can hear what happens. Okay. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame. Now who appeared to Moses? According to two. The angel of the Lord, sir. That's right. And the angel of the Lord was speaking out of the burning bush. Okay. The point I'm trying to make is many times in the scriptures, when it speaks of the Creator doing a specific thing, it always, the people who just read, shows you that the angels of him is doing, the Malaik of Allah Ta'ala does his work. Right, and they were men. And they can personify as men, okay. certain ones. But they are angelic beings, Malaik. They have the power, if Allah grants, to personify as human beings. They are what you refer to when they get into the earth, Earth's atmosphere as extraterrestrials. Yes, sir. You understand? Yes, sir. They reside in various pockets of the universe. They, they come from what's called the Crystal City. Which goes into a deeper thing. Alright? So it is quote in the Bible, when it's talking to Moses, speaking with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's through his angel, either Mikael or Jibrael. In this case, it's Jibrael. Those are the most powerful angels. The highest of all of the angelic beings from Malakut is Mikael. Because Mikael, like in, means light El. And that's from Elohim or Elohim or Allah. He's like Allah insofar as he has the power to sustain himself on earth. He came to Abraham he, in the Torah in, in Genesis. He came to Jesus. He came to Moses. He came to Muhammad. He came, as Khidr in the Holy Quran. He has Mikhail and he's called Melchizedek or El Khidr, Michael. Okay? And then he has an intergalactical name. And his intergalactical name is Yanun. Every one of the prophets, when they are out of the physical and into the spiritual realm, has an intergalactical name. Esau's name is Sanenda. When he's out of this. You understand? Yes, my Lord. So we're talking about angels who are who can personify in human beings as human beings and speak in representation of the creator of the heavens and the earth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? I hope yes, I hope Lord. you understand it. Thank you. Thank my you for the clarification. Mm -hmm. Assalamu alaikum. Imam, did you meet Melchizedek at the junction of the two nouns like the Mahdi? At the time when I was being brought to the consciousness of who and what I am, I met him at Tuti. Not knowing at the time who he was. 
I just thought he was an old man. And he told me uh, that just think and whatever I, what, he said, if you have pursuit of answers, think and I'll be there. I never knew at the time he meant that he was going to be in me moving outward. I thought he meant that if you need me, contact me, just like you would. If you need me, contact me and I'll let you know. I didn't know that young in my life who or what I am. It took me until I was 40 years old to realize that I was speaking to a reflection of myself. I had no idea. Thank you. What, um, what purpose does the sacred ash serve in paradise? The sacred ash serves no purpose in what you know as paradise. But in the, in the celestial or crystal city, there is incense that burns. And the ash from the incense can be transported down to earth plane as a sign that this person is in tune with that higher city. There's a city above the earth uh, called the crystal city which sometimes is mistaken for the mother ship. The mother ship or the ship that has the little ships in it come out of the crystal city. Crystal city is a, right above the earth and has been there for centuries and it's a whole city. You call it the city of Jerusalem when you say it's going to come down out of heaven etc. So there, there's incense burning there, material incense as you know it. All right? And ashes from that incense is the, what comes down as what you call the sacred ash. Okay? Yes. I have one question here. What kind of battle will take place with Michael and Satan? And where will it take place? Question is, what kind of battle will take place with yeah. Mikael and Shaitan? Or yeah. which kind did take place? Because remember, they had a battle already in the heavens, in Malakut. And he was cast down. Okay? Well, the question is, what kind of battle will take place? In the latter day. Yeah. And this is understood that you have read throughout your scripture that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking you to get not less than and not more than 144,000 mu'minun wa mu'minati to be ready to be taken up in a Isra like Rasulullah was, to be taken out of here before this wind, the four winds of the earth are let loose for destruction on the planet earth because shaitan is getting a grip of the planet he's asking for not more than and not less than 144,000 that will be taken up taken up it says in the scripture literally taken up and taken to the crystal city Malurat, taken right to the Medina and there they'll stay for a thousand years and be groomed by the elders shaitan and his wicked angels the cherubim are going to try to come into that city to destroy that city and those special people taken from earth to be gowned in white him and his cherubim are going to try to take the city of the seraphim you understand? Yeah. but they will be trapped, they will be baited like the story of Job and then he will be cast into the earth because you have a central city in the center of your earth I know this sounds crazy but it's true you have a central sun. There's a city in the center of the earth called Agrita. And the capital of the city is called Shambhala. And the temple where they keep Satan trapped with that hexagram is called Wahala. He likes Muslims to rise a pentagram, which is a five-pointed star. Because he can be trapped in the hexagram. In the six-pointed star, you can trap Satan. He'll be kept in that city. For a period of time, the so-called meridian, as they call it, the thousand-year period, that that 144,000 will be kept in the celestial or crystal city to be groomed to get their godlike or divine qualities back in them before they descend back to earth with the Lamb, which will be the angel Michael who will bring them back to earth. You see, Shaitan, like it mentioned in Revelation, is going to try to get up to that new city of peace and try to destroy that abode. That abode is called Darul Islam in the Quran. The abode of peace is not on earth. And in it are angels, they say in the Quran. Hauria. Those are seraphim and the masters, the awalina, the Quran says, the ancient ones. They are there to teach and try to get you prepared to come back in because you have to wipe away this earth and wipe away this heaven and bring in a new heaven and a new earth. 
So the battle will be fought because Satan is going to try to invade that very city, the crystal city, but shall be cast into the pit of the earth and down into the center of your planet. Like I said, there's a city. Inhabitants of the city are from Mu and Lemuria, they're from Atlantis, they're from the Mayan people, different people where, who were taught by extraterrestrials or angelic beings and were taken into these cities. And they're there now and the devil knows about it. And they would not even be on earth had it not been for 1945 when you people dropped the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki and it frightened the Galactical Brothers. Because you almost cracked the earth. So the elders had a meeting and came to the surface. You call them angels. Call them what you feel like. Came to the surface and said, we got to prevent the serpent seed. We call them the serpent person. The serpent and his seed from destroying you before you are ready. Before you are prepared. Before you are transformed back into a spiritual being. We got to stop him from destroying. The other night when they saw that green light, and he said it was, he, it was a meteorite. No better yet, I think it was a meteorite. There was no meteorite. I told y'all the ships are coming. I told you they're here. He didn't say it was a meteorite. There's no such thing as a green meteorite. Go back and study astronomy and show me somewhere where he told you about a green meteorite. He told you about pink stars, blue stars, and white stars. He never spoke about no green star. Or no green meteorite. And what kind of gas burns green? They burn blue, they burn yellow, they burn amber, but not green. Somebody's lying. So the battle that you spoke about between the elders is between those being prepared, the seraphim, under Mikhail, to suppress the cherubim, which is the 200 fallen angels, and you people on earth who are left behind because you don't come in and get prepared to make the transition from this state to the sacred city, you're going to be the playground of the devil. Do you know that the planet earth used to be a hunting ground? That the, the cherubim used to come here and hunt prehistoric animals through laser lights and kill them just for the fun of it? You have not only positive angelic beings visiting the planet, Ardu. Your galaxy is called Terra. It's called Terra. Alright? That's the galaxy you're in. You're on what's called Zorukaya. Zorukaya is the name of your planet. Alright? You have extraterrestrials, they become extra when they get inside here. Visiting you, all of them are not positive. Some of them are called Jinn. From the Ifru mentioned in the Quran, Solomon had big battles with these jinns who would come in and land here and they infiltrate man and corrupt the world. They mutilate animals. They come down and they mutilate animals. They hunt for the fun of it. They make themselves seen as UFOs and they hunt. They take people up. They abuse people. And then there are other galactical beings who are fighting against them, trying to get you people prepared, but you keep rejecting. You want all this fiction religion. You want to believe that Muhammad came with this new type of religion. When Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was in contact with extraterrestrials, when the angel Jibrael, salam alaykum wa rahmatullah, came to the prophet Muhammad in the cave, he came as light, he came as an Ethiopian, an Ethiopian being. And he came to Rasulullah Muhammad as light and told Muhammad that man has fell away from the most important commandment. Who created him and when? So he told Muhammad, you better go back and ikra. Ikra bismi rabbik ala Go back and read in the name of the very creator. You follow? But man refuses. Man rejects. He's been tempted by the devil. And the devil and his seed is here, like I explained earlier. And man loves him. And like it says in the Bible and Revelations, he wants to even live in the image of the beast. I would like to know, why was um, the devil sent to another planet? Well, two questions. Why was the devil sent to another planet? And also, why is he, why is he captured? Why do they have to catch him and take him to Shambhala and bound him for a thousand years instead of just destroying him? Because energy cannot be destroyed. You can only alter its appearance. 
And what a lot of human beings don't realize is that what they call the devil was once an angel, Malak. And he was created of Nair, a simul, or a poisonous type of fire. It's not the same fire as you find on earth, but it's, for lack of a better word, that's all they can use. And you cannot destroy energy. You can only alter its appearance. Or you can refrain it. You can discipline it. You can confine it. Or you can channel it. Now, nowhere has it been said that he was sent to another planet. It was said that he has left this planet and has gone on to another planet. It has not been sent. You don't send the devil anywhere. You have to trap him. And he's trapped by what's called the hexagon, mm -hmm. which is the symbol of the six-pointed star. Muslims all over the world, well, I, mean, I shouldn't say that because most Muslims out of America don't use it. Mainly you find American Muslims who use a five-pointed star and crescent. Don't realize that it's a symbol of the devil. They think that the five-pointed star and crescent is a symbol of Islam because Elijah Muhammad or because Nobu Juali or because some other brother told him that and those brothers were misinformed about the symbol of El Islam which is confirmed by the fact that in Holy Quran it tells us that all of the prophets of Allah were from Rasulullah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on back to Isa, al Messiah, Jesus the Messiah, on back to Moses and all the way back to Abraham, all were of one text, one scripture, be it a suhuf or al hikmah or Torah or Zubur or Injil or Al Quran, they are all one scripture from one sustainer of all the boundless universes who is Allah Ta'ala. You understand? Yes. There with then Dawood, David, who received the Psalms, was a Muslim, as the Quran confirms. You follow? Yes. And the spy-pointed star is not identified with any of the prophets of Allah in any of the scriptures, including the Holy Quran. There's no mention of a use of a five-pointed star by Muslims. However, it is understood through the Torah and mentioned the utilization of the six point of star, the hexagram, that Solomon used to trap the jinn the Quran speaks of. You see? So he builds his empire on a pentagram. Or when he takes a country, he puts a new five pointed star on his flag. The eye you see on the back of the dollar bill over the pyramid is a symbol of Nimrod. You see? They knew that the elders used to use the pyramids to travel intergalactically. They knew that. They know how all the pyramids are hooked up magnetically a perfect distance apart. They know that what you refer to as the Bermuda Triangle is really a pyramid sending up magnetic waves. They know these things. And they put the eye of Nimrod there. And that is their God. That's the one that was crucified. That's who was born December 25th. Isa Ibn Maryam, Jesus was not born on December 25th. Where they get this snow in Jerusalem stuff? I don't know. I mean, they made it up. Because they were talking about in the Caucasus Mountain where there's snow. There. <laughs> not in Bethlehem. You see? All right? Thank you very much. Molana, yeah, I'd like to ask you, um, the Universal Brotherhood of Muslims, uh, that's in our book, Adam's Calendar. Is that the same brotherhood that you were speaking about previously? The Brotherhood of the Elders? Yes. Yeah. The Brotherhood of the Elders are called the Brotherhoods of Peace. Darul Islam is one of the names of the Crystal City. Right? right? If you open the book of Revelation to the seventh chapter, you see it? And after these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth. These are the four ships. Holding the what? Four wings. 
Holding the four winds of the earth that what? That the wind shall not blow on the earth. That's right. Nor on any tree. Go ahead. And I saw another angel ascending from the, from the east, having the seal of the living God, my creator. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our creator in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed a hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. But notice what tribe they start off with. Number five. Because many people Jesus. say to me, is this Israel? And I say, no. Here's why. Because they don't start off with the first son of Israel. They start off with? Judah. And of Judah. And of Judah were sealed 12,000. Then they add, when you get to the seventh chapter, they add Levi. You see? And Levi was not one of the tribes. That was a priest tribe. They add Manasseh the son of Joseph. You follow? Yeah. So it's, it's not talking about the tribes of Israel, it's talking about uh, people like the tribes of Israel. Now, and here's how you know. Go past the, the, uh, the tribes and read nine. After this, I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. This is after the thousand year period when the righteous come forth, after the 144,000 have been groomed in the city, in heaven as you'd call it, then our people will come together and look up, all of them. And what's going to happen? Read them. And cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our Creator, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. That throne they're talking about is the sacred city. Go ahead. And all the angels stood around about the throne, and about the elders, and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces, and worshipped Allah, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory. Amen, meaning it's over. Amen. It's over. Go ahead. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be on and might be on to our God, our Creator forever and ever. Amen. There's no more devil power at this point. Go ahead. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? They want to know about you people. The elders ask, well, Who the heck are they? They're not angels. Who are they? They want the answer. And whence came they? Where they come from? How they get into the sacred city? Who are they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of, of Allah, and serve him day and night, in his temple, and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them into living fountains of water. That's called Kota, fountains of water in paradise. And Allah shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. This is what you're working for. The world. The destruction of this planet has been held back for you. Those people who get the seal of the Father in their head by consequence of prostration. Not those who get the seal of the beast in their forehead or in their hand. But they'll tell you, how will they gown themselves? What did the Master say they look like? In number nine? It was gowned in white. White robes. They know who we are and what we're supposed to be doing. They're waiting for you. You understand that? No. And they'll take you to the throne where you sit in the midst of the righteous. And the very presence of the Most High will be there. You feel His presence in the land. And there'll be no more devil reign or devil power. It'll be over. This is what you're working for. 
most people don't want to get there. All right? You have been listening to The True Light, a question and answer session with a Saeed Ali Mamisa Al Hadi Al Mahdi. Do you want to know the truth? Can you face the truth? Be sure to read the most dynamic books in history, authored by Asaeed Al Imam Isa Al Hadi Al Mahdi, on such subjects as What is a Muslim? Where is the tabernacle of the Most High? Should Muslims observe the Sabbath? Was Christ really crucified? Who was the Comforter? Now let us return to the true light with Asaeed Al Imam Isa Al Hadi Al Mahdi. Remember, you are the light. And you have the power over all things. Okay, in Exodus 34:33, um, I read, um, until Moses had done speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. Um, I was wondering, what's the purpose of this veil? And if the veil will always be necessary for uh, women to wear? Um, and was it always necessary for women to wear? Because... Like in Egyptian art, I never see that with women wearing a veil. Why? You know why? No. What language are you reading? Hmm? What language are you reading the dictionary in? English. And who mostly wrote them? Pardon me? And who are usually the writers of those dictionaries in English? English um, people. Or Americans. Americans. And they're not going to have y'all reading the Bible where it says a woman should wear a veil because then, see, the, let, look at this. Somewhere along the line, the Catholic Church tends to relate to the way Muslim women dress, all the way up until they covering their face. But somewhere along the line, in their doctrine of the Catholic Church, which is supposed to be the oldest church of the Christians, they seem to have understood years ago that a woman's supposed to stay covered, head and everything. That's why they had the nuns dressed that way. Then another thing, inside of a Christian marriage, we have what? When you get ready to marry, what does a woman put on? White Long white dress and a veil. Veil. If she doesn't wear white, that means she's not a virtuous woman like the 31st Proverbs. That means she gave up her virginity before she got married. Okay? So therefore, she would not wear a veil or a white robe. She could wear any color. Right? But they're telling you by that, that the long white dress and the veil is a symbol of purity. Next question is, did I make this up? <laughs> well, first let me answer your question. The reason why Moses had a veil is because Moses' brother, Haron, which we know as Aaron, was sanctioned by the Heavenly Father to become the high priest over all the children of Israel. And if you look up in any biblical dictionary, at the dress of them, the so-called ancient rabbis, you see a tiflin. A tiflin is much like a shawl that they wore over their heads. If you see any Jews in their churches or synagogues today, you'll see the same thing. They wear it over their heads and it comes down past and has little lines of blue and little tassels on it. You, you know what I'm saying? That has been the garb of the ancient Israelites for centuries. So when Moses had finished talking to the children of Israel, he took his shawl and threw it over his shoulder, which would be covering his face, or like you see in Arab sometimes, from the desert, and they were definitely in the desert, <laughs> take the shawl and wrap it around his face and turn and walk away. You've seen that before. Right? This has nothing to do with the Bible veil. The Bible veil, let's go back to Genesis, chapter 3, verse 7. And if we read it, we'll see, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. that's not there. That just means begin all things with the illustrious name of Allah, the Yilda, the most merciful. And their eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked. And what did they do? Sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Made an apron. They did not make 
a full garb. They made a short thing, an apron. An apron is something that does not go beyond the knee or above the breast. Now move to the same chapter, chapter 3, verse 21, and watch the Heavenly Father let her know that a short dress is improper dress. The garb of the veil is something that the Almighty Creator of the heaven and earth is going to make them put on. Watch it. Turn and read that. 24, you said? No, nope. chapter 3, verse 21. Oh. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. I understand that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now here we see that they had taken upon themselves to dress a specific way, which was identified as an apron, partial, and then the Almighty made them coats of skin. A cloak is the total cover. You follow that? Mm -hmm. And covered them. So the veil started way back with Adam and Eve had nothing to do with Rasulullah Muhammad and the sections of the Holy Quran which identify with it. You see? Mm -hmm. But people have this tendency of trying to make people think that the wearing of the veil started in Islam and started with the Arab people and was a custom. And they are lying because it's not where it started. If you turn to Genesis 24, verse 64. 64? Yep, 2464 of Genesis. Mm -hmm. We're going to see where Rebecca, we'll read it and see what we come up with. And Rebecca lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she lighted off the candle. Camel. Off the camel. <laughs> uh, for she had said unto the servant, What man is that walketh in the field to meet us? And the servant had said, It is my master. Uh, so what did she do? Therefore, therefore she took a veil and covered herself. You see? Mm -hmm. Now here we're talking about Rebecca. Way back in the Old Testament, during Abraham's time, this Rebecca was to become Isaac, one of Abraham's son's wife. Now, she belonged to the family of Abraham through his brother. And when she saw Isaac, which is one of her relatives which they married back then, coming through the field, she knew he was a strange man to her. So what did she do? She covered herself. She covered her face. Now to verify that the children of Israel did wear those veils, if you see in Isaiah 3, Isaiah 3, 18 to 23, it'll tell you also that all the Israelites at one time wore a veil. But because they transgressed against the law, subhanahu wa ta'ala, their veils and their tassels and their earrings and their nose rings was taken away. Now you read it and it says what? In the day the Lord will take away the bravery of thy, of thy tinkling ornaments about thy feet and their curls and their round ties like the moon, I mean their crescents, oh. their chains, their bracelets, mm -hmm. and their mufflers and their bonnets, their headpieces, the children who took them off. Mm -hmm. and the ornaments of their legs. Now you see the Jewish people wearing short skirts. And we're, go ahead, and their headbands, right? Mm -hmm. And the tablets, they don't read the scriptures no more. Mm -hmm. And their earrings, and their nose rings. Mm -hmm. And what else? And changeable suits of apparel. Oh, mm -hmm. And the mantle, and the what? Wimples, and the crisping pins, mm -hmm. the glasses. And, fine, and the fine linen, and the hoods, and the veils. And the last thing they took away from Israel was the? The veils. See, they stripped them because they transgressed against the Most High. The children of Israel have lost the right to wear all the stuff you see those guys on 42nd dressing. Stand down there with all that stuff on, right here in Isaiah, it tells them they can't wear that no more. And the so-called Amorite Jew, the so-called Hasidic Jew, he knows that. His woman wears a wig with a bald head. They don't wear the gloves no more. They don't wear the white. They don't wear the nose ring. They don't wear none of it. The only thing they retain the right to wear is the locks 
and the beard. And they've changed the color of their clothes from white to black, knowing that throughout Israel they wore shining white. Says it. You follow? Yes. Now, if we go to the Holy Quran, which is what which we should seal this with, the 24th chapter, the 31st verse, and read it. Bismillahi ar rahman ar rahim 24. 31. It says, and tell the faithful women that they are to lower their looks, their eyes, and guard their private parts, and don't display their bodily ornaments except what appears thereof, and make them wear their face veils over and down their bosoms. In their translations, they have cut all of that up. As you read yours, read yours and see what it says. From the beginning. Yes, please. And say to the believing women that they cast down their looks and guard their private parts and do not display their ornaments except what appears, what appears thereof. And let them wear their head coverings over their bosoms. See how they did that? Yeah. They took out words. And out of it we get wa and kul. Say or tell. Lil Mu'minati, those faithful women, you see that? Ya mm Dudna, -hmm. that they are to Dudna, be pious, lower the eyes, don't be staring men in the eyes seductively is what it means. Lower men of a Sarihina, lower their sight, don't be, don't be lustful and aggressive towards men other than your own man of course. Alright? Well, Ya Fazna, that word from al Hafizu. Which means, and they are to protect or guard Furuja Hunna. All of their private parts, that's their bust, their vaginal, their, not, their shapes of their body, their voluptuousness is supposed to be something sacred and it should be protected. That word there is Furuja Hunna. You see it? Wala and do not, wa and la don't. Wala and do not yubdeen. Don't make seen. Don't display. Don't allow. Don't let it be seen. What? Sanaytahunna. Any of their bodily appearance, which means not only are they supposed to wear loose garments, but they're not supposed to let things be seen, like a slit down the front where you can see what they refer to as uh, the shapes of their bust, or stuff so tight that you can see. You know, it, not only don't show your body outright but don't even let the what do you call it in English the image of it be seen the shape you know like in other words a person could be standing in front of you naked or a person could be standing there with clothes on and so tight she might as well be naked he's saying don't do either one of those things alright illa except for ma what zahar what already appears, which is necessary, which means, except for what appears, your hands and your feet. Those things, minha, except for what appears, like they say, zahara minha, except for what appears naturally, in other words. All right? I don't see that. That's because they have it as, except for what, how do they, how do they read it there? Uh, here it says, Except to their husbands or their fathers. That's because they added husbands and fathers. The word husband, you know, zoage, and fathers, uh, abu, or, is not even in there. They just added that in to imply that you can, around your immediate family, you can expose your body. That's what it meant. But it's not in there literally. They just put that in so they can convey their point. Okay. Okay. Then he goes, Well, Yadribi, right? Mm -hmm. And that you should be forced to Darabba. See that? Darabba is the Arabic word to hit or to strike, to hit somebody. And you should make it hit. Now, what are we talking about? There's a whole subject of the whole thing. Be Humari Hina. Hina on the end is hers. The word khimar 
means a face veil, but the root of it means a covering, khumra, to be covered or blocked or screened away. In the Holy Quran, in the 42nd chapter and the 51st verse, when Allah, Allah says, and Allah did not talk to normal human beings except by way of inspiration or from behind a barrier. And in Arabic they got hijab there. Hijab, the Sunni Muslim says, a veil is not that. A hijab in the outer world is a screen or a curtain or something of that nature. This thing we're talking about is called khimar or khumra. When they say a person is intoxicated, they say he's drunk khumra. Something that has blocked his mind to the point where he can't function. So there they have veil, meaning now something is, comes over hit your bosom and down and cover your face, it has got to cover your whole face. There's no such thing as partial. You see, if it comes over your head and down and hits your bosom, as it's going to say here, because it says Allah, over, the next word, over, or they say on, right? To you behina, their bosoms, their breasts, their things, saying come over, down, and strike their bosoms. They are evading this reality. But yet, when you look in the Far East, you see the women of the desert who have not been educated or indoctrinated by Western world still wear it. The Bush women still wear it. You can get any magazine from Geographic and fumble through it, and you see they say, this is Algeria. In the desert, you see those women with their veil on. When a man pointing the camera, you see them trying to cover their face, just like we showed you in the books of Genesis. So the dress of face covering is a law that was given to us at Adam and Eve's time, not with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, not with the Prophet Abraham sallallahu alaihi wasallam or Moses, but all of them had to live by it. In fact, even Mary, when the angel appeared to her, she pulled her covering over her, and he said, "Hail Mary, thou hast been chosen above women in the world." She saw an angel as a man and covered herself from him also, screened herself as they say. Okay? So that veil is a law. There's no getting around it. Okay. You have been listening to The True Light, a question and answer session with a Saeed Ali Mamisa Al Hadi Al Mahdi. If you would like a cassette copy of this week's True Light broadcast, send five dollars to True Light, seven nineteen Bushwick Avenue, Brooklyn, New York, one one two two one. Now let us return to the true light with Sayyid Al Imam Isa Al Hadi Al Mahdi. Remember, you are the light, and you have the power over all things. It's a known fact in Islam. The angel Gabriel, salam alaikum wa rahmatullah, came to Rasulullah Muhammad, the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in the cave, and said to Muhammad, it. Wa Muhammad Wukala Ya Jibrail Ma Ana Bikarian Wa Jibrail Wukala Aiden Muhammad Ikra Wa Muhammad Kala Mratania Ya Jibrail Ma Ana Bikarian He said Muhammad read He said Jibro I am not a reader <laughs> Muhammad read he says, Jibra, I am not a reader. <laughs> what is he asking this man? What is this extraterrestrial being asking of this man? To read. A very simple statement, right? What is Muhammad saying? I'm not a reader. What does he mean he's not a reader? He does not know how to read. That's right. Of my own, I cannot do anything. So the angel says to him, which is now the 96th chapter of the Holy Quran, and it's going to be mathematically equated in a way that's unbelievable. Alayha tisat ashra. Over it is 19. Jibrail says to Rasulullah, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Begin all things. In the illustrious name of Allah, He is the yield of the most merciful. Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Read by way of using the name of rabbika, your sustainer, alladhi hu khalaqa. 
who created خَلَقَ insana min alaq He created all forgetful creatures in sand, people, man, men, alaq from sperm gushing forth and dividing up Ikra wa rabuka al akram and we like this Muhammad by way of your sustainer who is karam who is so generous alladhi alama bil qalam he is which has alama taught bil qalam by using a quilt or a pen alama linsan ma lam ya'lam he it is who has taught you forgetful creatures what you could not on your own have learned. Those are the first five verses of the revelation that came to Rasulullah. He put the words in his mouth so that Muhammad would not speak of himself. He made sure that Muhammad just repeated exactly what was being said so he had no opinions. And Muhammad oftentimes said, I can't say nothing that has not come from Allah Ta'ala throughout the Qur'an. Most Muslims translate the word Iqra as recite, proclaim. The word Iqra means read. Iqra bismi rabbi kaladi khalaq. How do you know? You know because by the time it gets down to the fourth verse, it tells you. Aladi alama bil qalam, which taught by way of a pen. What do you do? When something is written with a pen, you read it. You don't recite it. You recite from your head. You orate from your heart. You read from something written. But all these Sunnis keep saying, no, it means recite. That's the devil leading them away from the true meaning. Because they don't want them to know that Muhammad was asked to read the Torah and the Injil before he revealed his Quran. And the Holy Quran in the second chapter supports that to the letter when we get to Surah Al-Baqarah when it tells you about what was sent down to you, Muhammad, and what was sent down from before you, Muhammad, when it says in the fourth verse of the second chapter, وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكَ وَمَا أُنزِلَ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ وَالَّذِينَ And those who يُؤْمِنُونَ They believe بِمَا by way of أُنزِلَ what was sent down ilayka to you, Muhammad, wama unzila min kablika, and what was sent down before you, Muhammad. Yet you have Muslims all across this country being taught and misinformed by Muslims from overseas who are trying to confuse them into not accepting all of the scriptures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This scripture tells you that this is plain and true. That these verses are clear. And it's telling them right there to watch out for translations and distortions of the Quran. Because it says right in the 12th chapter of the Holy Quran, Surah to Yusuf, بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألف لام را تلك الآيات الكتاب مبين يصير ألف لام را ألف symbol of Allah تعالى لام ليلة القدر the night in which he revealed the revelations to را الرسول الله محمد ألف لام را تلك that not this تلك that verse that sign تلك آيات that sign الكتاب مبين the scripture it is مبين manifests things and makes them clear إن أَنزَلْنَهُ Surely we, Allah and the help of His angelic hosts, did what? أَنزَلْنَهُ Sent it, the Qur'an, أَنزَلْنَهُ قُرْآنًا عَرَّبِيًا 
لعلكم We have sent it, this Quran, as an Arabic reading in order for you to be able to make proper decisions. تعقلون To be able to understand. But I told you right there, right here in the 12th chapter of the Holy Quran, in the first two verses, that we sent it down for you in Arabic so that you'd understand. And I keep telling you, go to your Imam and ask him, do you speak Arabic? Do you understand the language of the scripture? Or are you just talking off the top of your head? <laughs> اقرأ وربك الأكرم الذي علم بالقلم علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم صدق الله العظيم ربنا أكمل لنا نورنا وأكفر لنا إنك على كل شيء قدير Listening to the unshakable guidance and teachings of Asaid Al Imam Isa Al Hadi Al Mahdi.